What's up guys? So in this video, I'm going to be going over some tips and tricks in Godot. If you are an absolute beginner to Godot, then a lot of these tricks will be very, very useful. I'm going to be covering some more niche tricks, I guess, that people don't talk about as much. So some of them may be a bit interesting or you might not have heard of them before. But if you are more experienced in Godot, then you probably have. But either way, I thought they were pretty cool. So let's just get right into it. So the first one I'm going to be covering is export categories. So let's say you had like a player node or something and you had a few export variables. Maybe you have like the max speed and then you could have something like the acceleration speed let's say we had something like the player's name. And you can see that when we actually look in the inspector in our properties list on this node, they're all kind of just clumped together in the order that we declared them. So if you wanted to separate these, you can actually do it really easily with export categories. So we could put an export category right above these two export variables, which are for our motion. So all we would do is write at export underscore category. And then we just use a string here to put the name of the category, which will define anything under this. So for this category, we would call it maybe motion data. And then we could put another one right here. And this category could be called player info, maybe. And now when we go back into the inspector on the right hand side here, you can see that it categorized our export variables into two separate areas here. And this is just a really clean way of creating export variables. If you have a lot of stuff, you would want to organize it this way. So I just thought that was pretty neat. And the next one is just a friendly reminder to make use of groups. I know a lot of people forget about the group system, but it is extremely powerful. So let's create a new node here. I'm going to call this enemy. Let's say we had a ton of these enemies in our scene here and I could simply add these to an enemy group by going into the enemy scene and then on the right hand side you go into the node tab here and go to the groups tab under that. Now if I created a new group here I can actually go into the manage groups editor which is very helpful and I could add a group called enemy and just add enemy to this group. You can see back in the editor here we are in the enemy group now and I found this really helpful in some projects I've made where I can basically define all the enemies I have or I've done it in the past where I define any collidable or movable objects rather so I'll have a bunch of small objects which you can kind of push around in the world and I can define those in a group. And and then call like motion impulse logic on any collisions I have which are of that specific group instead of initializing a additional collision layer. But this was really helpful in one of my recent projects where I had a lot of enemies and it's really easy to get an array of all these enemies by simply calling, let's say in the player here, on the ready function, I'm gonna make a new variable here called my group members. And this will basically say get tree dot get nodes in group, which is a super helpful function. And then the argument here will just be our group name. So make sure there's no typos, it's called enemy, and then we can actually print my group members. We'll run this code, and you can see down here, it printed an array of all of our enemy nodes. This is extremely helpful, because you could then call functions on all of the objects in a specific group, which could be very helpful depending on where you're trying to use it. If you are trying to call a specific method on all the enemies or all the objects in a specific group, you can actually use this call group function and define the group here which would be enemy and then your function name would go here and then you can pass any arguments here and i don't want to set it to a variable right but do note that this would call the defined function on every node in the group on the same frame so you have to kind of remember that because any expensive functions will definitely slow down processing but typically this should be fine if you do want to call the functions one after the other like over the course of the next few frames, then you can actually use the method call group flags, and then you use the flag group call deferred. So that would look something like this. And then you would just pass in the flag index, which is two. So we put that right here, and then you would further define the rest, right? So the group enemy again, the method name, whatever you'd want to do. 
and then any arguments you may have after that. And this will basically call this method in each of the objects inside of this group over the course of the next few frames. And next up we have the assert function. So if you don't know what the assert function is, it's very helpful for any debugging that you may be doing. So basically how it works is you simply write assert, and then if the statement inside of here is true, the game will continue to run as intended, right? And if the statement inside of here is false, then that means the game will stop and it will break at this point and just stop the game. So you can use this to kind of check how your code is being processed at runtime. So I could say assert get child count is bigger than two. So basically, if the amount of children attached to this node here is bigger than two, in this case, three is fine, then the game will continue to run as normal. And we can test this out here, nothing happened, right? But let's say I deleted one of these nodes, but now you can see my child count is two, so it will not be bigger than to right so if i run the game the game will stop and it will break at this specific point because my game isn't running as intended which is actually pretty helpful if you have a lot of complicated logic you're trying to iterate through you can just throw a few of these assert functions in various areas and it makes debugging a lot easier now while we're on the topic of debugging we can also use this really cool method check to basically see if we're in debugging mode or if we're playing in the exported version of the game. So right here, we're actually gonna say if OS dot is debug build, then we will assert. So you can see since we're running in debug mode, we will assert the game. Now, obviously this is a very useless if statement since assert will only work if you're running the game in debug mode, but um, it is still a really cool thing to note because you can use it for any development functions that you may have. Now, while we're on the topic of the OS, there's a really cool one that I just found recently, and you can actually use this to move any files to the recycling bin. So this is very helpful if you're trying to create, you know, like some malware. Obviously don't do that, but you can say OS and then call move to trash. And then you just pass in the absolute path to the file that you want to move to the trash. And this will move the file to the user's recycling bin on their computer. And if the recycling bin is disabled for any reason, then it will instantly just destroy that file from their memory. So really cool thing. Um, I don't know if you would be able to directly delete any operating system files or if a defender would come into play with that, but it is a very um, powerful tool, I guess. I don't know how you would want to use it, but uh, interesting to know it's there. So there's that. And the last one I want to mention on the OS subject is OS dot shell open. Now you can actually do quite a bit with this function as you can see in the documentation here. We have an example where you can open a specific folder on the user's computer and it will try to open the resource with the most appropriate program here. So this would open the file explorer at this given path and if we pass in a link here, it will open our web browser at that specific link. So if you wanted to, you could have a cool little Easter egg in your game or something where you call OS shell open and then just pass in a link here. This link is obviously a Rickroll. So now when we run the game, our program will open up a Rickroll. Kind of cool function that I wanted to mention. And next up, we're going to kind of break away from those OS functions, but another really helpful tip is using custom resources. So I'm not gonna go into a lot of depth with custom resources in this video, but I should have a card pop up right now that you need to watch after this video if you're interested, but it will basically cover most everything you need to know about getting started with custom resources in Godot and going over how to set up a save file with those. And the next tip I have is using auto loads or singletons. So typically in my games, I'll like to make a singleton folder down here and you can basically create a new script down here. We'll call this global data. That's what I like to name my basic singleton. And I like to just store references to a lot of nodes I have in here. And you can also use signal calls from this to activate specific game events easily, like updating the UI instead of trying to find the node from a relative path and then having the entire game break when you move one node away from there. But essentially how this will work is we'll have a script here. We can have any methods or node references in here that we wanted, but we can actually go into the project settings up here in the auto load tab and define this script as a singleton. So all we need to do is open the script up here 
We'll navigate to the new global data script and give it a name, which I'll leave default and click add. And if it's enabled when you run the game and go into the remote tab, you will see that the global data node is now right inside the root of the game. And this is important to note because it is outside of any other scenes you're processing in the game, which is super helpful since it will never change location. So it's good to store references in here just for consistency and to prevent your game from breaking since you can easily get singletons from any script anywhere in your game by simply calling the name of that singleton. So if we called global data, you could see we just got the script right here and it's that simple. Next up is a bit of an interesting one and I'm going to set up a quick example for this so you can see kind of what's going on. But let's say we had some motion in our game, right? And I'm going to grab this icon here and add a quick animation player. We're gonna make a new animation. So now if we start the game here, you can see that our icon moves across the screen. Now in the current project I'm working on, I have a lot of complicated and fast moving collisions that I'll need to set up. So they're kind of hard to debug, right? When you have a lot of collision shapes, even enabling visible collision shapes in the debug settings here, it still kind of gets confusing. So every now and then you'll want to kind of slow down your game. I use this for debugging purposes, but it is also helpful for effects. So I've seen people use it for hit stop effects in the past, which is an interesting way of managing that. And you can also use it to just slow down the entire game. I guess I should mention the function already. We're basically going to call engine, dot time scale and then we can set this equal to a float and this will be the multiplier of the entire engine's process time so if we set it to 0.5 for example that would mean that we're processing everything in half speed so this animation will take twice as long now if we wanted it to go twice as fast we would just set this to two and now the animation will only take half a second. And next up, we have two kind of developer settings, I guess, which are helpful when making games. But the first one is really basic. A lot of you probably know about this one, but just editor descriptions are super helpful. So what I used to do in other game engines that I've worked in is I would make notes externally in like a Google Docs or something about different scripts and how they work and connect with different aspects of the game. But it's a lot more organized to just simply put stuff that's really easy to forget and really easy to find on the node specifically. So if I had any notes about this enemy, I just go into the editor description, write any notes I have. And then there's another property we actually got in Git 04, which is the metadata. So on any node, I can simply add this new metadata here, give it a name, and then define a type. So we could literally do any resource type here. I'm just gonna do a float. And when we add it here, we have this new property we can set to anything. And this is super helpful, obviously, because I no longer need to create a script for this object to add a property. I can simply add a new property here for any static data that I need on this specific object. I actually recently used this in an animation function. So basically what I did is I set up a quick boolean here, which was called something like a like a key marker or something. And I used this metadata as basically a marker that I can key into an animation and then I can get that specific data path on the animation as an index and then get the key position for the animation. And then I can simply just key this in whenever I want a specific blend time. And it's all using just a node in the editor. So it's really clean. I don't have to make any static data or scripts and I can just visualize everything a lot easier. So it does have a lot of really cool uses and you can really do some creative things with the metadata property. And the last thing I wanted to mention in this video is a reminder to use curves. So curves are basically the coolest thing in the world. So whether you're trying to scale the difficulty of your game over time or you're trying to manage some sort of positioning or motion for a specific node or even if you're trying to tween some animation a specific way you can use a curve to handle literally anything you want and you can get really creative with how you use curves how you would use a curve in Godot is let's say we had a new folder here called like my curves we're just going to put that there and then we would just right click and say new resource and we just search for curve here 
we have a few options i'm just going to do a normal curve and then we would save it as new curve in this folder and it saves it as a resource so we can just double click this curve and open it up and in the curve editor on the right hand side we can just right click to add a few points and we could say like this is the difficulty scaling for the game you know a basic curve right for now we're just going to use this and i'm going to show you how to actually get the y value from a specific point on this plane so in our player example script here we can make a new constant and we're just going to name it my curve for now and we're going to set it equal to preload and we're going to select our curve resource now in the ready function we're just going to print the y position of a specific x value on that curve so we're going to say print my curve dot and we can use the sample function and then pass in a float, this float being the X position. So if we pass in, let's say 0.25, run the game, and you can see right here, it'll print the Y value of that position on our curve, which if you go up from 0.25, right, that would be the Y value, which is about 0.509221553, you know, you get it, right? But as you can see, right, curves are extremely powerful, and I highly suggest you start using them more. Even if you're already using them for everything in your game, they are super helpful, and you can always use more curves. But anyway, that's about it for this video. Um, if you enjoyed the video, or if you learned anything new, make sure to like and consider subscribing. Otherwise, um, thanks for sticking around and if you have any suggestions for more tips and tricks that weren't shown here Or maybe the community just never really mentions anything about them uh, Feel free to leave them in the comments I will be making more videos like this in the future and I want to cover as many tips and tricks that you guys have as possible So so if you want to do the community a favor drop them in the comments and I'll add them to a list and get them out there as soon as possible. But again, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.